Gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Nice to have you guys back. Good to be back. Yes. Two, two black Likewise. shirts and a blue shirt. And I got a dark blue shirt, uh, sweater. Well, you guys look like the Black Brothers or something. Wow, they're not the Blues <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> serious I don't know. Way, I don't, well, welcome back, gentlemen. It's always good to see you guys again. I, I know that there was a little bit of snow outside and a little bit of... Uh, it's all good. It's all good. They, I, I wish that we almost start way when the very beginning of the time we start so people get a better idea of how much effort there's involved to actually just get this going. There's a lot of work involved, right? So now we're actually um, finally going to do this first show where we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk to someone, we're going to call somebody, which is really interesting. So we've been talking about this the last time we were on the show. We've been talking about it behind the scenes for quite a bit of time, and uh, we've been fortunate enough to have someone to call in. Uh, so are you guys ready for that? You guys want to touch upon what we want to do on this show? Any, no, any I thoughts? Ju I just want to reiterate what I just shared with all of you before we, we went live and the fact that I'm nervous, I'm frazzled. In, in how you started us off, now I can't just imagine the individual calling us in. So before we do, I just want to acknowledge whoever we're going to be talking to today, yeah. that you are absolute champions. Yes. And uh, I salute you. And I look forward to speaking. We all look forward to speaking with you. Yeah, this doesn't happen without the audience out there. Yeah. Right? We mm -hmm. know that. Um, so so thank you everybody for being a part of it and it's a it's a it's a I, we know how difficult this could be right so we're, we're just trying something out is it gonna go smooth we don't know let's just see how it's gonna go but we totally appreciate it. and uh let's give her a call you guys ready to do that yeah let's do it all right Hello. Hey, it, it, it's Karis. How do you pronounce it? That's right. Yeah, Karis. Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure. So, hey, it's Manny from the Construction Life. Uh huh. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. How are you? I'm good. I've got uh, Jean Luca on the mic here. I want to say hello. Good morning, Karis. And then I've got Jonathan. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And then Angelo's here as well. Karis, my number one commenter on Instagram. How you doing? Yeah, there's no possible way I'm going to remember all those names. No, no. Just remember, I guess, TCL. We'll start with that. That's uh, you got four <laughs> gentlemen here. We really uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're on the job site right now, so uh, we, we really uh, appreciate that you, you reached out to us and then shared some, uh, some key things that uh, has been going on, is currently going on. And uh, so thank you so much for making the time. You're very welcome. Where do you want to begin? Uh, I was hoping you could offer me a little bit of guidance. Sure. Well, I know that it, I, I was curious myself because I know you mentioned that you didn't start into the trades until your 40s. Um, yeah. So I was curious about what other career options did you go down before you got into trades? So um, because school was fairly easy for me, um, I was guided towards university track. And um, I actually have a Bachelor of Science in Secondary English Education. Nice. So I'm a high school teacher. But um, I taught for two years. And it was the most awful experience of my life. I love the kids. Um, don't get me wrong. It's just the whole... The balance between parents, teachers, admin, and trying to actually help the kids learn while you're managing the classroom, it was just, it was too much. So um, I tried a few other things. I've been a corrections officer at a maximum security prison in the state. Um, gosh, I've worked in finance and I managed my family run business, which was a, a flower and gift store. And we did that for about 10 years. And then my mom wanted to retire and I didn't want to be a small business owner. So that's me. That's a little bit of a challenge. I do want to ask you, was it um, regarding the educational system, are we forgetting about mm -hmm. the kids primarily? Like, are we putting other people in front of the kids? I'm not sure I understand your question. No, I'm just saying, did you get frustrated because of the parents and the teachers and I guess the institution itself that they're forgetting about the children that need to be educated and they're just putting other priorities in front of them? Was that part of the reason why you're, uh, you had some issues with the educational system? I think it was um, for my situation specifically. I was in a private school and there was a focus on a student being 
of a big family. Okay. So make sure they like you because they have three younger siblings that the parents will probably put in this school. Got it. So it's a business. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, they were looking at the at the uh, far reaching investments that, that were coming down the line. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They weren't necessarily worried about the kids. Um, same thing when I noticed there were some telltale signs of a few learning disabilities in some of the kids. I talked to the parents. I recommended that they put them in public school so that the kids would have access to the resources they need in order to have a successful life. And obviously the admin didn't like that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess, yeah, you could say that there wasn't enough emphasis on um, not necessarily the education of the children, but the needs of the children. The needs. Yeah, that's yeah, actually a better word for sure. So maybe let, let me well, ask you a question, Karis. It's Angelo here from Human Side of Construction. I think we've interacted on Instagram, too, and I appreciate the you know, insights I'm you sorry, provide. I'm having a really difficult time hearing you. Oh, All right. can you uh, can yeah. you hear me now? I can hear you. It was just the last gentlemen I, I couldn't hear him. oh sorry can you hear me now um yeah do you mind like projecting as if you're on the job site yes i will shout how about go. now oh my god that's so much better Thank so there you. we go hey sorry it's it's angelo from human side of construction i know we've interacted oh, on hey, instagram cool. hey good 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 and I'm, I'm glad to uh, to finally be speaking with you so uh, just a quick question because you have a very interesting background and you've worked in different industries and I know you've mm -hmm. dealt with, uh, you know, some other challenges in your life that you mentioned, ADHD, you're a breast cancer survivor. And you've, mm -hmm. so, so maybe share a little insights on how your experience within construction dealing with those issues, um, for lack of a better word, compared to other industries and, and, you know, how, what it's like working in construction with, um, with those, uh, you know, with the stigma and everything that surrounds that. Sure. Does that, do you understand what I'm well, asking? I, I do. So I believe that my career as a corrections officer and as a teacher really helped me prepare for construction because I learned to, so I'm just going to back up a little bit, full disclosure, as well as ADHD and breast cancer survivor, I am currently on the adult autism assessment wait list. Okay. So um, I and my family doctor also believe that I am autistic and that that led to some of my challenges socially. Now, what that also did was it encouraged me to use communication as like a special interest. So that's when I studied English. I love communication. I love learning words, ways to say things, different creative ways to communicate ideas so that people who don't think the same way that I do might have a better chance of understanding me. So all that said, um, I had a really good experience working with um, in corrections because that taught me for um, that taught me uh, structure because the, it's the same day every day. Um, you learn routine, how to develop that, how to be kind of a self, how to be self-sustaining. Yeah. Um, and those are really good things that prepared me for the construction industry. As well, being an educator really helped me because I find so many times I deal with people who have, for lack of a better word, the old school mentality, meaning faster is better, not necessarily quality. Yes. Um, fewer words are better, not necessarily understanding. It's true. And the, uh, the different career paths that I've had, as well as some of my challenges, they have really helped me because as long as somebody is at least open to trying to understand me, <laughs> then uh, we actually get along pretty well. So it's, it's kind of neat. Um, the company that I'm with right now, they have, so I'm a, I'm a residential finisher. I'm a finishing handyman. Okay. And I have such a keen eye for detail that part of what my autistic traits is I notice detail before I notice the big picture. So I'll walk into a home and all the deficiencies, they just like jump out at me like waiting flags. And it's <laughs> super easy for me to just run through the whole house, tag everything that needs to get fixed, and then start my process. Um, where 
somebody who didn't have that necessarily would have a much more difficult time. Like I get people asking me all the time, how the heck did you see that? And like, uh, I'm autistic. And then they look at me really funny and we laugh. So, um, <laughs> do they engage with you? I'm just curious. Do they, they, do they inquire more when you tell them that you're autistic? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Um, occasionally I'll get people who kind of look at me like, Oh, what a pity. And then I just, Say, oh no no, it's okay. Like I don't see it as a weakness. It's just a different way of thinking. Um, I saw somebody who posted maybe almost a year ago, and they said that if you think about the difference between autistic way of thinking and neurotypical way of thinking, it's basically like two different programming languages. So like I'm running on Apple and everybody else is running on Android. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can play together. Yeah. It just takes work from both sides. And when I'm able to explain it that way, I find that very often I'm met with empathy. And then people actually try. <laughs> instead of just saying, um, you know, instead of just humiliating me um, or laying me off or whatever, um, I had another experience. The company that I'm with right now is fantastic. I feel very much seen and appreciated for what I bring to the table. When I started, that was not the case. Um, I was doing decks and fences for the landscaping sector with Lyuna. And um, I was a very small company that I was working with. And my foreman, for a while, everything was great. But because I have what's known as a... <laughs> spiky skill set, meaning I'm really excellent at some stuff. And there are other things that I'm very, very poor at. And it doesn't really seem to make sense. People assume that because I have such talent in some things, that that will transfer over to everything. And that's just not the case. That's not um, the case for so a lot of tradespeople. I it's true, and I think that there are a lot of neurodivergent traits people yes, that have gone undiagnosed exactly. because yeah. they come from poverty. Yeah. So either immigrant or um, poverty background, because we don't necessarily have, I use myself in that, but uh, I'm being female, um, we were very, very underrepresented in the diagnosis. Uh, the diagnostic statistics over the last few years. Yeah. Um, it was actually only in the last 20 years that women were, quote, allowed to get ADHD and autism. Mm. Is, it, is, so that, is that a statement that was told chance. to you, Karis? I'm sorry, is that a statement that was told to you that women were allowed to get that? No, we weren't. It, we, it, it is, um, that's a fact. Really? So there's a book called The Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, Right now, we're running on um, version five, so the DSM five, mm -hmm. that all of psychology uses to diagnose people. Okay. According to the version of the DSM that was the updated, most recent version when I was in school, you could only get a diagnosis for either of those two things if you were a boy. How does that make sense? Like I'm trying to like make what, sense but of what, it. But what is the background behind inferring that? Like was previous studies like precluded women from experiencing this stuff? Or, like that just seems kind of ridiculous. Like I'm not um, a scientist, but I use common actually, sense. Well, here's a fun thing. Um, only in the last decade was it mandatory for there to be more than male test subjects in medical research. In the last decade? Yeah. So we're talking... Like, it wasn't even a requirement for us well, to be studied. Today's it was just assumed like, that we would display it in the same way. But we don't. I think that that's a good... And sorry, it's, it's Angela here again. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Thank okay, you for good. projecting. Good. So I think that's a perfect example of how... We've talked about this before. All this stuff we're dealing with mental illness and mm -hmm. everything that comes along with it is so misunderstood or under... Uh, under uh, yeah. Like, uh, understudied. And we're just coming yeah. to light and we're only t touching the tip of the iceberg. Like I have friends so, and family who are just now in their 30s and 40s realizing being diagnosed with ADHD. They've always had trouble yeah. focusing. They had a hard time learning in school. They had different learning requirements. And they've lived their whole life thinking that they were screw-ups or didn't fit in. But it turns out they just needed, you know, a little 
different care, different treatment, different types of communication. So maybe just to pose another question to you, Karis, if I could, because I know Mm -hmm. our time with you is limited and this is a really good conversation. But like maybe for people listening and people with a similar experience to yours, what are some tips that you would maybe give, you know, based on your experience for dealing with potential cases like this? Like now that we know and we're starting to be aware that this is an issue, what's a different way that we can maybe approach certain situations well, can, on site? I, I actually just want to step in just briefly. I actually wouldn't even title it cases. I would just mm. people. Sure. Sorry. I, yeah. No, no. I would just look that's how I'm looking at it because I, I guess there's certain words. Um, and, how about suggesting the word situation? Situations. situations is even better. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's like, I don't think that we need to go down and, and, and I guess title yeah. the, the incorrect mm-hmm. words um for these situations i totally agree with you on that and i do i do want to mm-hmm. apologize i i speak no, from no, the I'm heart just, and I, yeah. i'm not using the right words no no, no. but my no inter- it's okay manny i think uh your your background is very technical would yes. that be correct yes and you're used to formal report writing etc possibly but i mean i've been so known to share it a would few- make sense that that would be a word that was easy to access i mean this is what you hear how i'm responding yes that's what's called uh, double empathy. So it's the double empathy problem, air quotes, that is basically one person decides that they know how communication should go. And anyone who doesn't communicate their way is communicating wrong. And everyone has to learn how to communicate their way. Well, then there's somebody else who communicates in an entirely different way. And that person is convinced that their way is the only way to do it. So the problem is that you end up with both people needing empathy for one another. That's very true. So the double empathy problem is something that we all face because we're always going to be communicating with people who have different styles, whether it's because of their culture, whether it's because of their religious background, whether it's because of their educational level or whether it's because of um, a neuro difference. So the way that I have been able to kind of navigate around that is showing emotional vulnerability and trying my best to develop um, emotional intelligence as best as I can. So trying to keep my eyes open for potential misunderstandings and doing my best to clear them up. So um, I found that when I've been in the break room with the guys, by showing my emotional vulnerability and being very open about my own challenges, some of them, not all, but many actually, have uh, been like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I kind of think that way too. Maybe I'm on the spectrum. And I'm like, well, maybe you are. If you think you are, there's a very good chance that you might be. And then we'll talk a little about stuff. And then some of the guys who aren't, they're very curious to hear a different perspective because of the way that I'm able to deliver it. Because I'm not delivering it like an old school mentality, hollering and name calling and all that yeah. stuff. Um, just to go back real quick, if I can, for a second. For sure. Um, to the company that I worked with in the landscaping sector. Um, My foreman, he looked at me one day like with such confusion and like hints of anger in his eyes. And I was like, what? What's going on? He goes, you can't be that dumb. I said, pardon me? He goes, well, you just said this and then yesterday we were doing that and you should know how to do this. And I'm like, okay, maybe I should, but I don't. So would you mind helping me out? Teach me. Mm-hmm. And he just looked at me, he goes, you can't be that stupid. And pardon my language, I don't know if you're going to be bleeping this out. Can I swear on the podcast? Oh, you could totally swear on the construction. Okay, yeah. all right, cool. <laughs> so he's like, you're fucking with me. You're fucking with me. And I'm like, I swear to God, I'm not. I'm being completely genuine. I'm being open with you. And I'm being honest with you. And he's like, "Uh uh-uh, you're too smart. You're playing games. I know you're playing games with me. I see you. I see how you work. I know you're manipulating me. And from that point on, that was it. He made up his mind that I was manipulating him 
And he's like, I don't know what kind of game you're playing. I don't know what you're trying to pull. And uh, that maybe two days later, I called my union rep and switched sectors. <laughs> well, sounds, like, you. sounds like he had his own issues he was dealing with. It sounds like the, the gentleman, hi, hi Karis, Gianluca, it sounds that this gentleman had uh, his own, possibly his own self-esteem issues. I believe he did. And, and I think, um, as is common for many people in our industry, English is not his first language. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe for a while he was struggling to see if maybe he was misunderstanding because of the language. And he couldn't quite figure out where our communication was missed. And that was before I realized that I was autistic. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was just a quirky weirdo. Um, I am a quirky weirdo. Also, I have autism. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Coincidentally. But, um, I didn't have the, the words to be able to explain to him what was going on. So it was a bit confusing for both of us. If I... So, yeah, yeah, if I could just go back to something you said, because I think it's really important where, mm -hmm. you know, how you speak openly about your experiences with people mm -hmm. and some people start thinking, well, you know, maybe I fall somewhere on the spectrum. I think we do. And like me growing up, like I'll be 40 this year, but I remember as a kid, you were, I'm using air quotes. I know you can't see us. You're not in the studio, but you were either normal, quote unquote, normal or crazy. Right. And normal was like, you know, every, what everybody wanted to be. And if you weren't normal, you were like a person in an, in an asylum with a straight jacket being medicated. And there was no in between. 100%. But now we're finding that there is a, nobody is quote unquote normal because everybody's different. And we're all somewhere right. on, on a spectrum, right? Yeah. And it's just figuring mm -hmm. out where you are, what your needs are, because everybody's different. And, you know, finding out what you need and how you can be successful. And as management, exactly. as company representatives, as union reps, as supervisors, it's important to have training in these aspects to recognize the signs and how to best cater to people. Because there's an old saying in construction, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Yep. Yeah. And you can't do the same thing every time with different people and expect the same results. Now, there is a line because you can't cater to every single different person. So it has to be within reason. But I think we need to do more to equip at least the supervisors to you know, recognize these situations and do something about it yeah Karis, uh, well, it's, there's, it's Jonathan, there's a, a, John, go ahead Karis. go ahead okay. um just uh, for a little aside um there are a lot of similarities between what we're talking about right now um and uh some of the issues that i deal um because of my gender on the job site which i know that's not what this is about so i'm going to keep it about mental health um no but it is it, i i, there, I there still want to I'd like to still there hear from you about that as well. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. a very important inter intersection. That's that's um, why, yeah. Yeah. But um, one thing that Layuna is doing, which has been absolutely amazing, is they are starting a program called More Than a Bystander. And it is specifically to train union rep business managers on how to recognize and support women who are facing difficulties at work because of their gender. And they're, they're actually stepping up and grabbing all these old school guys and training them to say more than talk to the company about it, give them the chance, and then get back to me. And then, of course, obviously nothing ever happens. <laughs> so a few things cares can i just say uh, first of all thank you very much i know that it's been longer than the time i just trying to i want to get an idea of your time and your availability have you snuck away from the job site right now do you have time to still stay on and, and speak with us or do you have to go at any so given time i slid my lunch break so that we can have this conversation did you have um, lunch and i don't know if you heard me background noise there but that was my uh, customer service manager um, causing some rumpus downstairs, and I just texted him. I was like, "I'm on a podcast. I'll, I'll be a few minutes." And he goes, "No." <laughs> I don't worries. want you to get in trouble, but if you like, you give us. Can you give us an idea? What do we have left with you? Like five, ten minutes, kind of thing. Uh, we could probably do ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I just want to give the gentleman here also some ideas of, of going that. And I, 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 when do you, Luna? When did they start that program? Did they start that recently? Yeah, just this year. This year they started. Okay, well, good for them mm -hmm. for doing that. And then I'm sure that they're going to be paying attention to how it cause and effect rolls out. Um, it is. I'm, I know it's going to be a game changer. Awesome. Um, 
Victoria Mancinelli is doing amazing work here in Canada with Luna as far as the, um, uh, sorry, I just had a brain fart here. Um, this is what happens when you have an auditory processing disorder and you're speaking off the cuff. <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great, you're by doing the way. Amazing. This is awesome. Um, she's just been doing amazing with uh, women and women's issues. Uh, she represents the entire women's caucus in Canada. She works single-handedly. In the U.S., there's a whole crew. Um, but she does everything for the women's caucus in Canada. Uh, and she is just doing remarkable, remarkable stuff. She's been in charge of, like, making sure we have washroom access. And she actually was actively involved in getting the legislation changed, which I'm sure there are a lot of really happy people on your side that have to pay for women's porta potties now. Um, <laughs> but we're really happy because we don't have to share porta potties with boys. Um, but yeah, no, there's just like been a lot recently in the last just couple of years that um, Victoria has been instrumental in. Sorry, that's just my little pump for her. No, totally. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I actually want to, Jonathan, you got something. I just want to ask you, are you hopeful that con that construction, the industry in whole, as a whole can change? No. Ooh. I hate the word hopeful. It's flaccid. What do you it think? It has no power behind it. I'm right confident there. that it is changing. Okay. Well, that's good. No, I, I agree. I see the change that is happening. And these people that are on... Um, it's funny because I get into these, uh, Manny reached out one time because I was in this little, uh, Instagram battle with a troll mm. and, um, he was like, I hope you're not taking this too seriously. Like, I hope you're okay. And you can like, da -da. I was like, man, don't even worry. I, I got this. Um, but sometimes we get these, these reactions from people that are like, Oh, that's the industry. That's just the way it is. Well, it's not though. It's, it's the way not, it was. And, and it's it the way it was. But it's, even then, that's not true. But it's, it's the because way it's built. Construction has always had the good guys. Mm -hmm. There has always been that honorable carpenter. There has always been that plumber with integrity. There has always been that electrician who cares more about the safety of the people in the home yes. than how many piecework things he can get done. Yes. So yeah, the, I think it's a bunch of bullshit that the construction industry is like that, in air quotes. Because it's not. Maybe the biggest part with the most money have been allowed to get away with being like that for a long time. But with social media now and everybody communicating, it's stopping. I think, K Karis, it's Gianluca again. I think it's probably safe to say that um, due to the people that give everybody else a bad name. We've all been pa painted with the same brush and hence the reason mm -hmm. why uh, the industry's looked at negatively and that mm -hmm. we're still having difficulty. I, I wouldn't say convincing, but educating others, in the, including the public, that there are still a lot of great people in our industry. You know, my hobby was really important um, for that with me. Um, because when I was working for this landscaping company, he was like, babe, it kills me to see you coming home literally battered and bruised because you're these guys donkey. It's like, you're not a donkey. Mm, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, but that's what construction is. He goes, no, it's not. Mm. That's what this company is. This company treats you like a donkey. This company has a foreman who is rude and is abusive. But that's not the industry. And I'm like, yeah, it is. Come on. Everybody says blah, blah, blah. But he's the one who was instrumental in opening my eyes to seeing that there always has been a very um, uh, good, I hate that word, uh, hmm. <laughs> side of construction. <laughs> yeah. Well, and... and I know your your time is limited. Here, no, we got we got we got to wrap it up. If you guys have any final thoughts yeah. you want to just share, and and we're very thankful that you got made the time. But any thoughts, guys? Keep speaking your truth. You are helping a lot of people, and you are bringing sure. an immense clarity to what seems to be very muddy right now. And I I uh, I salute you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I'm immensely grateful. 
Yeah, I really want to echo yeah. that. Is, is, is simply to say thank you. You've unpacked a lot of stuff in such a brief period of time. It's touched, moved, and inspired me. So, you know, you're making a difference out there, and having this conversation has been huge. Thank you for for making the time to be here today. Yeah, like the mo- the most important stuff about all this is normalizing these conversations because everybody experiences things differently, and exactly. I'm sure there's so many people who have shared your experience and haven't felt comfortable telling people or expressing their discomfort. So thank you, Karis, for your bravery and being part of the show and look forward to connecting with you some more online. Thank you very much, Karis. Really appreciate your time and, and, and all the words of encouragement that you've shared on the show today. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and um, share my perspective. Um, and if I could do a quick shameless self-promotion. Oh, you can do all <laughs> kinds of promotions. Please, by all means, take as much time Fabulous. as you want. <laughs> Um, there is another podcast that I'm on and it's called the BPD bunch. So BPD meaning, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot one of my diagnoses. Come on, brain activate. Bipolar? Borderline personality disorder. Okay. Yeah. So that's something that a lot of autistic women were getting diagnosed with because we couldn't be autistic because we were female. Um, Anyway, uh, so I'm on a podcast that is a mental health podcast called the BPD Bunch, the Borderline Personality Disorder Bunch. Awesome. And we did an episode that was an, entitled Working. So BPD and Working. Some people are unable to work because their BPD symptoms are just too problematic. Mm-hmm. And others of us have been able to find niches where our BPD is not problematic or maybe even beneficial. And I was on the working episode and I spoke a lot about construction and mental health and the benefits of working in a trade for people who have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to go and um, to YouTube or on Spotify, uh, pretty much everywhere that podcasts are, the DPD Bunch episode on season two on working was just a, a really, really fun one that people might be able to get something really good out of. Get, no problem. Get, we'll actually put it in the show notes on our show here. So we'll we'll include the hyperlink for that. So anybody who's curious about watching it and, and paying attention to it, by all means, we'll, we'll, we'll make awesome. that connection. Awesome. Thank you so much. No. And we'll, one quick question, Karis. If you were to mm-hmm. leave one gift for those coming after you for the construction industry, what would that be? Eight mil nitro gloves. There you go. Safety first. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Honestly, thank welcome. you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend. Really appreciate <laughs> you taking you. the time. You thank you very much. Okay, take care. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> that was awesome. That was amazing. That was good. There was a lot that there. That was really good. Oh, there was. There was. She's an excellent she's orator. Yeah, like she's super clear. There's no misinterpretation. I'm uh, I'm absolutely blown away from the conversation. I saw Angelo take his TR off, so I took my TR off. Yes, so. yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess I, we can debrief a little bit about, on that. Totally. But I just want to touch on something. And I'm going to apologize to you guys, anybody listening. Cause, and, and it's not like anything bad. But part of the problem, I think, with these conversations are people are afraid to use the wrong words and say the wrong thing. And that's why a lot of people stay in their shells. Yeah, I agree. So I used a wrong word there, case. I wasn't talking about a clinical case. No, it case. was funny that you said case, and all of a sudden the no, word case just stuck in I my know. head. I didn't mean it in the no, clinical No, 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 but I didn't, I didn't want to attack I you totally on know. that. No, I totally know. Yeah. But it's, I'm glad you did, because for people listening, it's, it, terminology is very but important. But she had a much better this. word at saying situation. The like, double empathy. Yeah, like and, it, and, that made more sense to me when we, I heard it. We've talked about before, too, is like, you know, empathy and compassion are huge components of dealing with these things. So anyway, and I'm probably going to use wrong words again too, but I'm going to so speak, <laughs> speak from the heart off the top of the head. Cause that's where the good stuff comes and we'll just keep the conversations going. This well, is what we but look how quickly we pivoted. Yeah. Yeah. We right. Evolved from yeah. It. And there, there was no harm, no foul. No, no. And I know it wasn't a big deal. She wasn't offended. Right. She was totally cool with it. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I just, I'm putting it out there. So you guys feel comfortable yeah. not holding back. Yeah. At, afraid of saying the wrong thing too. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm super happy you brought that up because I think not, I, I remember sharing with you on a, on a telephone conversation, but I'm, it, it's starting to rub me the wrong way that I'm, I'm self-censoring. Mm-hmm. I'm watching every word that's coming out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. 
because that's not my authenticity. And I'm probably, a, there's more than likely a few reasons, but one of those reasons is it, I don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. But in speaking authentically, you, you, you know, you're, you don't go out with the intent to offend someone. It's also an opportunity to educate yourself and, mm -hmm. and listen. Well, it's an opportunity to communicate with yeah. others about it, right? Not R dismiss right. each other. But it's also an opportunity for educa self ed education, but yeah. education as an industry. Look at where we're coming from. As an industry, we've got miles to, to, to go. Effectively, we've got some good news from our friend Karis, who just said yeah. that we're doing good, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing, but uh, self cemetery is something that uh, continues to be something that rubs, rubs me the wrong way. Well, is it ever going to go away, though? I mean, our brains are designed to label things. From your mouth to God's I ears. I don't because think so, right. too. Especially when you see, you know, some people getting crucified for some of the stuff they said that may, might have been misinterpreted, or maybe it was, you know... We're taken out of context, man. Like, yes. that's, the, that's the unfortunate part of, of the world we live today, where you might say something, and somebody's going to snip this and Six say, Angelo words. said this. Yeah. yeah, but what was the context of the background? Yeah. And it wasn't malicious or, or intentional. So, yeah. I, I But I, I do like that she's not backing down. Yeah. Like, I do like that she's pushing forward yeah and wh while putting your her arm around you and educating yeah, you at yeah, the same that's time what i mean it's that's, like that's a giant she's of an not individual doing what others are doing reacting to her yeah mm -hmm. you know she's doing the complete opposite she's an exemplary amazing. individual yeah. yeah so that was great yeah. very grateful and i know that angel you had something to do with connecting you she's a she follows oh you. no yeah i think both of us but okay yeah she usually comments and likes the posts that i put out and we usually have an exchange and I think, yeah, there was one time where, because so, I get a lot of stupid comments like, oh, you know, construction is man's work. Women should stay out of it and shit like that. And I think she jumped on one of those comments mm -hmm. and there was a bit of back and forth. But and that happens, man. You're going to get idiots out there. But I think, you know, and to focus on another thing that she mentioned, which I thought was great, especially coming from a woman with autism in the construction industry. So like all the stuff that, you know, is typically not accepted or deemed the old dogs. normal. And, yeah. 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 Focusing on the positive. The way, she, like when you said, are you hopeful? And she stopped you right away. Right away. said, that's bullshit. Confident. There were, there were always good yeah. people in there. And it was, it was really nice to hear that. Because even somebody who had challenges and is dealing with a lot of shit was still able to find the good in people and the industry. And that's the message I think some people listening and watching should take away. Because there's a lot of amazing things about the industry, right? Yeah, I was excited to her openness, right? Like she really leaned into her past experiences in education mm. in the correctional facility and brought everything forward. Mm -hmm. And to sort of holistically sum all that up, you know, you know, it sounds like the, the tipping point for her was a conversation she had with somebody else. Whether it was, her, I think she mentioned it was her husband that yep. said, "It doesn't have to be like this." Up until that, well, point that's in time. that company. <laughs> yeah, with right? that company, right? Yeah. But there's that tipping point, and the the thing that stuck in my mind was again the importance of simply getting it out there. Mm -hmm. creating a different reality so i want to move on because i know that we had th uh, two other people as well too but just because of situations we can't connect with them on the phone but angel do you want to touch upon the one email that came in you want to discuss that sure yeah so we ha had somebody reach out they weren't able to call in but they wanted uh, us to share their story um just to you know provide another real life experience of somebody who's working in the construction industry so i've got an email here i'll just read it if that's okay with you guys yeah so. totally so our story comes today from a senior project manager in the U.S. Their career began working for various remodeling contractors as a teenager. After high school, they pursued the electrical trade in a family business and were sworn into the IBEW, where they completed a two-year residential apprenticeship with honors. Their pursuit of knowledge led them to earning a construction management degree. And after pursuing academics, they gained experience through internships in several states before landing at an electrical contractor and now works on the general contractor side as a project manager. However, their journey has not been without challenges. John was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of five. He's had to manage a mind that never turns off, analyzing issues from multiple angles until exhaustion sets in. This way of thinking, applied to the multitude of decisions a construction manager has to make daily, you can see how this could be overwhelming. On top of this, in 2014, at the age of 28, he decided to be honest with himself and ended up meeting his now husband on Tinder. Although at the time he was partially closeted, it marked a significant personal milestone in his life. Along with the racing mind, he's battled a strong sense of self-doubt, imposter syndrome, negative self-comparison, anxiety, depression, and a constant questioning of his ability to be quote-unquote successful. Despite these struggles, he's made more progress than he ever planned with each year being better than the last. 
Over the past five or six years, he's worked on brain functions to slow down his natural thought process, although the mindfulness hasn't been automatic and requires consistent effort. He believes there's many out there, many others out there who struggle with similar issues, and he wants to help any way he can. This story serves as a reminder that everyone has their own battles, and it's okay to talk about them. It's okay to seek help and work on yourself, and most importantly, it's okay to be you. Thank you for sharing. That's that's yeah, it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Any thoughts, guys? On <laughs> I there's a lot of trades people yeah. like this out there. Yeah, there's a lot. Like he mentioned self doubt and bot- imposter syndrome, uh, anxiety, mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll throw myself in the mix. Mm-hmm. I, those check off a lot of the boxes for me. Yeah, and he is right. And Angelo re- uh, repeated it and sharing that with us that there are a lot of other p- people out there in our industry or out in society for that matter that are going through this. And uh, the more we talk about it, the more we normalize things, the more we'll start yeah. recognizing each other. It's all about, you know, seeing, getting the, the, the comfort in knowing that you're not alone, right? And, and creating a community out of it. Versus the opposite end of that teeter-totter is you have to pretend like nothing's going on and you got to show up and, then, and, and, and suck it up, yeah. which is and what we're here today to, to um, dissect, right? So... John, thank you for that. That's huge. The the ADHD, well, there's a couple of things that stick out for me if I can go. The ADHD yeah. portion, you know, at the age of five, I I know friends who kind of went through a similar process early on, and this was before people understood a lot about it, right? So they were experimenting with different medications, different treatments, and it wasn't like it is now. It wasn't as understood, and I'm sure that posed a lot of, a lot of challenges for him. Uh, I liked how the word successful was in quotation marks. And we've brought this up in the, in the connotation of like social media, where it's the perception of being successful. Like what is being successful? You know, a wife, a kid, a picket fence. Nobody has a picket fence. We talked about that one. No, we talked about it. You know what I mean? So it it seems like when you're striving to attain this level of success or perfection, that's unattainable. It's individual. You're setting yourself up for failure. It is individual hundred percent. Yeah. So those are the two things that stuck out for me there. But I mean, construction's guilty of always trying to keep up with the Joneses mentality, right? You get on a job site, you're trying to figure out who wants to climb the the ladder to get the promotion or whatever, to get the better opportunities, to get on the different job sites or whatever it is. So you're mm-hmm. always, I guess, I have a better word, stomping on each other. Yeah. Because they just perceive that maybe others are doing better than mm-hmm. them. So they want to try to get ahead of them. Is that what's going on? Is yeah. that where that definition of successful is coming from? Possibly, possibly, or maybe like and we were dealing with this uh, at, at our kids' school, funnily enough, with children, but it's the same thing. I, I think when somebody feels that they aren't at a certain level of success or status, they see other people that they perceive maybe higher and they try and bring them down, right? You know what I mean? That's why you have bullying. That's why you have people talking shit and causing trouble because they don't know how to deal with their own issues and they may be trying to blow out other people's candles to make theirs shine brighter. Well, that is a ultimately, question, you either support somebody along their journey or you, you, you take it down. Yeah. Right? There's two different... You either help build a building or you tear down the building. Either mm. way, it's where does the construction industry lean into most? Most times, it's, it's tearing the other building down and making mm. the other person feel like a piece of shit. Mm. Labeling them. Yeah. And, you know, similar to Karis in, the, in this example, he's dealing with multiple factors, right? Like being in a heteronormative industry well, like it's amazing that these people that have come forward and we know more of these people out there, they have all this stuff going on. And I keep on reverting back to everybody has stuff going on in their lives, but they've got such a, a list of things that are happening, you know, internally with themselves. And then they still have to achieve the scope of work, mm-hmm. the duties that are associated with being that trace person or that skill. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not dismissing the individuals that don't have any of these issues going on and they just got to focus on the skill set, but maybe, have a little bit more consideration before you start passing judgment on anybody because we don't know what's going on in individuals' lives. Yeah. Personally, professionally, yep. mentally, all kinds of things like that. Mm-hmm. This goes back to what Kara's talking about, the word empathy, mm-hmm. right? Like, holy shit, man, what's actually going on in your world? Yeah. And there's, I mean, everybody, you said it, everybody's got something in their world. It might be the biggest thing. And in your world, it might not, you've already dealt with it. So it's not as big of a deal. Yeah. Is it? Sorry. Safe to say that our industry is empathy deficient. Empathy deficient. Now, having said that, uh, do we operate at a, at a pace, and I already know the answer to this one, but do we operate at a pace in which we're able to introduce empathy? 
Because if you need to be empathetic, you need to slow things down. Karis mentioned it. But if you not know? now, when? If not us, then and, who? And we've mentioned this before too. Like, yes, there is going to be a cost of dealing with this stuff and looking into root causes of mental health issues and creating space to be empathy and vulnerable. But what's the cost of not doing it? Like, because that's what we're paying right now. Because like predominantly, I think the way construction has been operated, a lot of people got into construction back in the day because they couldn't fit in anywhere else. You know, immigrants coming back, you're Portuguese, I'm Greek, you got the Italians in the States, there's a lot of Mexicans. And it's, they couldn't, didn't fit anywhere else. They couldn't do anything else. They got into construction and they're in survival mode. Yeah. So they don't have time to worry about what's going on there. What's going on here? How am I feeling this and that? Cause they got to put fucking food on the table for their kids. So I think now that the world has evolved a little bit and we're more, you know, up to speed on these things, it, it, do you guys think there's two different worlds going on here when it goes to the high rise where you get a lot of the unions, you get a big corporations and it's, it's a little surprising that she brought up that Luna actually just started that this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're into the end of March right now and they just started that this year. This is something that I feel that it should have been started 10 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, but I get the sense that I guess the corporations are doing something because they've got more of a larger workforce, but you think it's moving faster and better and people are being more understanding on the, custom side of re- uh, renovations or construction itself or are they I think, it to, I think it's down to the leader it gets, it gets down to the people either running the, the project well, that's what I mean is you've got a smaller ship so then you've got fewer employees and I guess it does come from the GC or the owner of the business and it kind of trickles down to the workforce versus a huge corporation that's doing high rise after high rise after high rise and you've got hundreds of tradespeople on there and we pretty much are feeling confident that Every single one of those tradespeople have something going on in their lives, right? Personally speaking, right? It it may not be to the extent of what's been shared on this this show today, but it's probably close to it. Could be so even worse. It could even be worse, exactly. And and so they're doing things, I guess, at a corporate level. But is it connecting with the workforce versus a smaller level when you got a custom builder and they've got a smaller team and you got a GC speaking to the team? Is it connecting better? I. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to put Karis on the spot. And she probably wouldn't have the answer. But it's great that they're doing this training. But are they doing the training to make a difference? Are they doing the training to say... That's where the corporation <laughs> Look, question. guys, look. Yeah. We they checked the box. We they did the, the training. Box. We care about women. We love women. Come to the industry. We have training on how to do it. Well, that's why I want to see the cause and effect of it. I'm I'm very curious to see how the rest of this year rolls out. And how people are, because, you know, conducting the training is one thing. How are people reacting to that? Are they walking out of the room and forgetting about it and laughing about it? Probably. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm too cynical. Or are are they walking out? That's why I think a smaller company that has a smaller workforce probably gets to every single one of those individuals yes. a lot they connect better but, but are they doing it i'm, I'm of the, the other thing is, are i'm they of doing the it? i agree yeah i'm of the experience and in, and in, uh and knowledge meaning by way of conversations that um i i feel that what i'm what i'm hearing and what i'm seeing is that bigger corporations the the, the bigger boys air quote and the uh the unions have a better leg up on this their coffers are deeper they're able to do something about it whatever that about it is, but the small to medium enterprises, they're, they're behind the eight ball. Again, I go back and it's, this is not an excuse. Everything, you know, there's, there's uh, in order to understand the, the full parameter of things, the speed in which our industry operates at for small to medium business to be able to include all of this empathy work and the work towards uh, normalizing conversations around mental health and, and staying on top of their, even their health and safety game, Man, jobs go way too fast in order to be able to, to, to do all of that. And, and we yeah. keep agreeing to crazier and crazier demands and expectations mm. from not only our industry, but even for the, from the clients that we accept to work with. And by saying accept is that I'm a firm believer that not everybody uh, should be working with each other. We need to dial things back, slow things down, and, and, and you know, find out what our individual core values are and as companies determine what the core values are, are with the companies and only work with those that align with them, then we start get, getting a little bit more breathing room, being able to, to, to find more time to address these things and stick to them. So I got that and I, and I, and I get you all. And I still like to challenge that question, if you don't mind. Ever. The, the original question was, 
And if I get it correctly, Manny, it was small organization versus large corporation. What's the diff, right? Well, does the messaging, which is actually connected, which is actually connected with the workforce. And, and, and my biases and my experiences suggest it depends. It depends on who's, who's actually who's speaking steering the, the ship so mm-hmm. and who gives a damn. It's well, leadership. listen, yeah. here, I, um, it might be leadership. And then there's multi layers of leadership, right? I mean, here's the thing. Empathy for me starts with connection. When you connect with another human being, that's going to carve the pathway for empathy. How do you connect with somebody? You pick up the phone, you call. You know, if, if you're having a rough day, maybe I'll, uh, you know, send you something. Just even a text message. Maybe, you know, if you're having a kid, send a basket. Mm-hmm. Send, buy a lunch. That doesn't have to be a big corporation. It can be a small corporation. Mm-hmm. And the big corporations, I want to acknowledge them because I've come from them. I've lived it. I, it, it gets down to how much autonomy is provided to the folks running the sites. Because that's where it starts. Like, you know, when you actually connect with somebody, that becomes reciprocal, and then it opens a door mm-hmm. to empathy. And I, just to elaborate on that and expand on, like, my point of view, too, I agree 100%. And you mentioned, like, you know, sending gifts or baskets and stuff. Like, that's a minimal cost. But the shit that works the best is free. It's talking, talking to people. It's connecting to them, having a conversation, making them feel acknowledged and, you know, validate their existence and their contribution to the company. That stuff is free. And I don't know, I think because a lot of sites are big, like you mentioned, on a high-rise job or industrial, you have hundreds or thousands of people. So you can't physically connect with every single one. But that's where the, and you mentioned leadership has different levels. So there's like senior leadership. But I would also consider a foreman or a four-person leadership of a crew, and they might be responsible for twenty people. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. So it has to be at all all different levels for sure. The, the stuff is free. I mean, even if you when you I live the high rise world, guys, you walk a job site and even just connecting with somebody, even if I know the answer, maybe I'll see the plumber like, hey man, what are you doing? Cool, tell me about it. Mm-hmm. Even if I know the answer, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. instead of walking with my head down on my phone, head up, shoulders back, like I see Manny, how's it going? Mm-hmm. Shake his hand. That's where it starts. Mm-hmm. And then it can pivot to different conversations. There's something that came up, I think, when I was first on your show. We were talking about just saying simple things like "good morning." Yeah, the good morning people. Thing. And you mentioned what, what was something you did. You learned the different languages of people because yeah, you always right. have pockets, right? You might have people speaking Spanish, people speaking Portuguese, whatever Arabic. And if you talk to somebody in their language, how do you think that's going to make them feel? You, they light up like a Christmas yeah. tree, of course. Yeah. Hundred percent. There's two other words that go uh, very far: is please and thank you. Right. Oh, manners don't. No, there's no place in construction for those, Gianluca. But imagine if we did insert. That. <laughs> and I'm then you sarcastic. get a guy like John. Let's come back to John for a yeah. second, right? Once the connection is there, you know, he'll when he's got the time and space, and we're using John as an example. He's going to open up and say, "You know what, Jonathan? Thanks for saying good morning. It's not the best morning for me today, and yeah. here's what's going on." Yeah. And yeah. just shut up and listen. Yeah. Provide that space. Do you guys think it's right that a tradesperson should leave the company or should the company be better understood of the tradesperson? Because unpack like, that a little bit, yeah, a little bit more. Well, I just like, I, I get the sense that a lot of people that are going through some of these issues, they'll just go to a different business, a different company because they're just getting so much, you know, so many issues are just not being dealt with or they're not being heard. They're not being spoken to correctly. Uh, they're not being understanding. So then their thought process is, I'll just go to a different company. When I think the thing is that that, that company should maybe require the overhauling. Oh, there's no doubt. I, I, I don't. But which is a better state? I, I, would sooner, uh, I would sooner hope that they could stay with the same company, unless you're talking with a company who treats people like, you know, complete well, what garbage. if it's a mixed bag? What if you actually have some great coworkers? You get along really well. You're understanding with each other, but maybe upper management just doesn't care so much about you and your issues, and and they're not helping you. So then your thought process is: you've got two roads to, to to decide on. There's a fork. You either stay here and keep on dealing with this, or you find another employer that's going to possibly listen to you and treat you with a little bit more respect. Well, naturally, I'm gonna I'm gonna con- I'm gonna tell someone to look after their best interests. But in order to do so, they need to be well prepared and well versed in order to identify that the next company they're going to matches with their core values, that they align with respect to, with respect to values, and they they understand and are and buy in 
what their comp- what that company's vision is. And this is where, uh, and culture also. And this is where a lot of the companies, I would sooner say the majority of the companies in, in the construction industry, they don't have core values. They don't uh, have yeah. their, uh, their vision and or cu- culture identified. They don't have a mission statement. Not that it makes a, b- a huge difference, but it's still... It's still very important. These are things that can at, at least help individuals be able to identify if they're going to the right people, right? And, or else you get you put it, you fall victim to going uh, to the other side where the grass is greener and yeah. only find out that the grass blades are just pointing in a different way, and it's the same thing. So, so cu- culture, can I can I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. So culture is an interesting thing because I've, I remember talking to my where I work now, Martina, uh, the president Dominic. We're talking about the company culture. He goes, I have a mission statement in my mind. It's written down, but I don't want to tell anybody. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, because it doesn't matter what words you put on the wall. It's the behaviors that represent the, the, your culture. Because you can put, if you put something on the wall and say, we value this, but you act completely different, people are going to see you right through that. Yeah. And culture just comes down to behavior. And if I, can I just keep going? Yeah, yeah. If I could reframe your point in a different way. Put yourself in the position of that employee who's thinking about, I'm not treated the best here. I'm thinking about leaving. How comfortable would you be going to, like take your own personal experience at different places you've worked. How comfortable would you be going to your manager saying like, look, I don't know if I fit in here, the cult and getting into that conversation. I bet you most people wouldn't. They would, they would sooner just like jump ship, go to the next one because it would probably be an awkward conversation. But they would be afraid that if they had that conversation, they'd be on the chopping block because oh. Jonathan, he expressed he's not happy here. We should probably get rid of him before That's where he I quits. get the sense that they're leaving. Yeah. I think that they're leaving. Yeah, they're just bolting. Well, yeah. I, I think it could be an and conversation. Mm. I think I'm going to go back to framework that Karis used, which was the, um, the double application, the Windows versus Mac. I think that there has to be an mm. understanding on the employee and the employer, perhaps before labeling and... And I mean, that word keeps coming up for me, and I'm not sure why, except that if I'm the employee, maybe I want to... F- fully understand and and change my or, or attempt to take a different perspective on my employer so I understand and then have a conversation and vice versa. I mean it's what's the what's what's the better solution? I don't know that there is a better solution because you're gonna start over and then you start What's the learn. industry currently doing? What do you guys think they're doing? You think I think that the tradespeople are just leaving Oh they leave because that's the easy thing to do. Leaving. They're not confronting it, they're not questioning no, they it. They just they're, bounce they're not asking uh oh. Stage one or two. Keep going? I think there might be testing. Oh, we'll find out shortly. <laughs> Doesn't smell like anything's burning. Okay, let's keep going. But no, to, it's to, a test. It's a test. to your test. point, is that what happens? It's They leave. They leave. They leave. No, you hear, so here's what happens. I, I can't speak from the trade perspective, but I've been there on the project manager, project coordinator side. You bring it up with your manager and they say, okay, yeah, we'll work on something. They we'll should do a different job. Six months yeah. later, nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're working on it. It should be coming any minute. Six months later, how about, no, yeah, yeah, no, I haven't got it. Okay, I quit. Phone call the next day. Right. We'll give you whatever you want. What do you want? You want it? That's how it works. Really, yeah. And it's, it's like people are treated. They're just like, it's like. I know, but the mental state of that individual in those six months or six years. They're you fucking know what with I mean? them, man. Yeah. And some people put up with that for years, literally. And how does that make you feel as an employee? There are those. Worthless. There are those at, at at that level, that that level of leadership, that actually just don't give a flying fuck. But there's also those that are equally as buried. So they are legitimately mm. trying. Mm. Now I'm not defending what what you just said. I agree with it 100. Mm. percent But I'm just trying to break this open so that we see it all perspectives. You yeah. know, remove the, the the blinders. There's a reality here is that there are leaders out in our industry that want to do better, but they're equally as buried. Yeah. Right. They can't see the forest from the trees. Well, that's. That's a good point if I could segue into the next story. Sure. Yeah. Just to keep things moving here. So Alexander, who wanted to call in, but something came up, maybe he'll call in on another show, um, wanted to talk about that topic um, around, like, what are one big issue causing mental illness and, um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there. One big issue causing, like, mental illness and is stress in construction, right? It's right. a stressful industry, right? Because there's a lot of money involved, there's a lot of risk, yeah. a lot of labor, and a lot of different different types of characters. But the point that he was focusing on, it was the pre-planning and the pressure that is put forth on the job, like right from the beginning, when you sign the contract and agree to these unreasonable schedules and maybe a price that isn't accurate, maybe below cost, and you're just downloading the risk and the stress and all the problems to the project team and what impact that has on their... Why are the individuals doing that? Because they're just afraid of employment? 
Which individuals? Well, the, the companies are agreeing to take on these duties, these scope of work at that rate because they need to just feed all these mouths that are in their circle. So that's just compounding the stress on the personal side, yeah. coming from the professional side, vice versa. Is that, I guess the real question, why are they doing that? I mean, I guess they're not being educated enough to say no and try to look for other opportunities. Fear and limiting beliefs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The fear of not getting more work and the yeah. limiting beliefs that if they went outside of what the, the, this trench that they've been going down, that brings in whatever work brings in comes in the front door. They're afraid that if they get off that and go down their own beaten path of having to determine what their core values are, established their their culture, and gone after their ideal client avatar, they fear that they're that's that's not going to be a, a strong enough uh, or fruitful enough pipeline, mm-hmm. and that that couldn't be farther from the truth. Not only will you get people that you are in, in entities and corporations that you can work better with and have a better experience altogether but you'll have also it'll it'll show in repeat business it'll show by way of of profit it'll show in less aggravation and more than likely i could go on but more than likely also you'll have less people bouncing but these, you know these because the stress is all uh, it's it every, shit flows downhill man these trades you, people in their businesses they don't learn this like i didn't learn this the first year it mm-hmm. takes a few years to learn this it takes time i i'm very I feel good to say that I think the younger trades nowadays, the ones that are starting out today, they're learning it a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. So they're you making those decisions like the, a lot faster. Like the business side of... Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing you're not taught about, right? If you come up with the tools, your trades... Per, even but in today's digital age, they get to learn that a lot faster, I sure. think. Sure. Exactly. The information's there. Yeah. That's the, a good yeah. point. They can. However, I... Um, again, I'm not disagreeing. However, I think uh, a lot of these... Um, a lot of our youth that are starting businesses in construction are still going to fall into the same trap. It's, oh, I'm not it, it, that. Totally. It's an industry that's yeah. like quicksand. In, Once it sucks you in, yeah. you've got to fight like hell to get, to get the fuck out in, of it. You know, information knowledge is one thing, but it's mindset too. And I don't want to get too freaky deaky. Jonathan, you'd probably like this stuff. But scarcity mindset. It's like that's what you were saying. You know? Switch from that competitive plane to the creative plane being like, look, if we all find what we're good at, and find our niches and stay in our lanes, there's enough work to go around and make money. Instead of saying, no, this is mine. It might be the last one. You know what I mean? Like, It's also on, on top of everything that we've shared so far. It's also the fact that um, we've been conditioned to compete against each other, right? Well, and I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned here, but I mentioned on, on, on quite a bit actually at nauseum almost. Maybe people are starting to get fed, fed up with me ma- mentioning it. But oh, yeah. the construction industry <laughs> has... Uh, has agreed to a Faustian bargain. So the, a quick definition of a Faustian bargain is like a deal with the devil. And for two, only, for two prime reasons, opportunity, projects, mm-hmm. and wealth, money. Mm-hmm. So we say to anything, we say yes to anything that brings us in work and money. And that's, that comes as, at a huge cost. The mm-hmm. cost is stress, aggravation, and that, like I said, mentioned earlier, it's like a, a river that flows downhill. And who brunts the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, force of that? It's our workforce. And then we start wondering why people are, are stressed out and, and, you know, and, and maxed out and reacting let's, uh, the way they are. Let's, let's do a little exercise here. Can I have some fun with this? Of course you can. Sure. Have some fun? Okay. So, Where are you going? I'm getting this hammer. Oh, okay. So this hammer is risk on a job. And we're going to play a game. We're going to start over here. And we're going to end here. Sorry, ladies. I'm going to leave you out of it if that's okay. They're so not this on is camera. the risk. <laughs> Manny, you are, you are in senior management. You're making the decision whether or not to pursue a job. What do you want me to do with the hammer? So it's got a tight schedule. It's got a tight budget, but you need the work. Are you going to take it? This? No, because I'm older. And oh, I, you're supposed you, to say yes. I'm supposed to say yes? yes. Why? Because oh, wait, wait, hang on a second. <laughs> what, at what point in construction am I at? Is this my first year? Is first this my, year. First my year. First, of course first I'm going to. I'm going to hang on to it. it. Dear okay, life. So pass it on. So now Manny has made the decision to take the job. And there's a lot, a lot of risk, a lot of stress in it. He's passed it on to me, who is in middle management. So now it's my turn to set up the pre-con and hire the project managers and do the tendering and all that stuff. Sure. So now I'm going to pass it to Jonathan. Here you go, buddy. It's a shitty job. I'm sorry. You're the project manager. You know, do what you can with it. Best of luck to you. See you later. Don't call me if there's an issue. <laughs> right. So now Jonathan's got, he's the project manager. Okay. Now he's going to organize the trades. He's going to do the tendering. He's going to do the coordination. He's got the baseline schedule. Everything's ready to go. Pass it to the next guy. John Luca, you're the trades on site. You trades got, on site or not the site manager? You're the trades on site. <laughs> okay. He's well. the site manager too. So now you've got to get the work done. 
We'll be here. We'll do everything we can to support you. But right. you're responsible for getting the work done. By the way, there's liquidated damages. There's penalty clauses. And uh, don't fuck it up. <laughs> and you're on the hook. So who else right. is there to pass it on to now? There isn't it's anybody. You're at the end of the road, buddy. Yep. I just Good luck. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Thanks. How's Pretty the job good, coming eh? along? <sighs> right. So Did why it? can't that responsibility backtrack to us? It should. It, it's Shit. easy when I go all the way back and when it started with, uh, with Manny. I took it on. Yeah, you just say no. But, yeah, but in order to okay, be able to say no, you, know, you need to have the dashboard built in order to identify whether or not that client or that opportunity matches. Again, I'm not gonna, I don't want to beat a bit dead horse, but the, the answers are all there. It's here's, all more values and culture. Here's something that I heard over the show when I was at the CMPX there is that I heard there was a cancellation of 40 towers recently. Ooh. In all, in, of, in, in all of GTA. Just GTA. It's not surprising. Well, I bring that up because what about that stress? Yeah, so of the people who are counting on that work. Well, if I go yeah. back to your, your exercise, Manny's taking the work because he's got a responsibility in his mind to keep the... Keep, I know, so I just took work. work. Revenue, I took contracts revenue. and now I just got the contracts back to me saying, we're actually putting a hold on this. We're canceling this project. We're canceling this project. We're canceling that mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. And now what? You got a responsibility still to keep his food on the table. So we have to manage that. But too, I got to right? let you know, that we you just don't have a job. lost that job, lost this one, lost that one. Now what? It's a lot of pressure for an owner or for, for leadership to be able to, if leadership cares and, and, and have uh, scruples so to, what, to balance that and be able to deliver that. What's going to happen to this generation of tradespeople? Because I strongly believe that that's just a tipping uh, point of this, of what's going to about to happen in Toronto. Like, we know we're not hitting the, the markers that the politicians are asking us regarding how many homes are going to be built, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's cancellations of these projects, where a lot of them, first of all, you got projects that you have tradespeople not being paid by me. You know what I mean? Yep. By, I took on the job, and now I didn't make that much money, so now I'm going to be, you know, whittling all that down, going, I'm sorry, but you're not going to, you start this other job, and I'll pay you finally, mm -hmm. right? You got that whole fiasco going on, but now I'm losing jobs now. As yeah. a result. So now I've got nothing on the schedule and you guys were counting on those jobs. What's that going to do to the whole industry, trace people, their mental state, their well, anxiety? I'm, I'm, if I'm a, 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 an employee of yours in your workforce, I bounce, right? Because I need a work. You're going to gonna find wherever you can. Well, yeah. And that means that it could be one of many ways. If I'm already having mental health problems and I bounce from a company that's somewhat taking care of me or, or understanding... And I bounce because of money and because of lack of work where I am currently. I've, I may very well find myself in a position where I'm working for somebody who's 10 times worse. Yeah. And what do you think happens to my mental health afterwards, right? Well, that, that was one of the things that came up in the studies that you and I talked to Sid about in, in Colorado uh, Boulder campus. And in other studies was job uh, instability was a main factor of mental stress, mental illness in construction, just for that reason. Because it's totally out of anybody's control, except yeah. the owners. If they, di if they didn't have committed funds and they were taking a gamble, fine. But everybody else buys into it. And it's not just like, oh, it's too bad we lost a job, move on to the next one. Because I know I've worked at places where if you win a big job, you stop quoting because if you fill up the coffers for two, and, it, and, and it's years, it's not months or weeks, two years from now, all of a sudden that job's gone, there's nothing to fill it. And, it, and yeah, and it causes Yeah, but what rift. happens to that tradesperson? when that happens because they're on a high mm -hmm. because they have work mm -hmm. for the next year, two years, whatever the schedule is. Mm -hmm. Right. And now that's all taken away from them. What do they start? Like what's that, what's that mental state of them driving home to their personal responsibilities? Like it's a scarcity mindset right away. You're freaking out because you got nothing. So now you're, you're clawing away at, at finding whatever comes your way. It's natural. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. Sometimes you may have to do it. I hope it never what happens. happens. I hope at, we get to a point. What happens at home? Oh, you, you bring it home yeah, and, and you dump it onto it. your wife and kids. You try, you're, you're, you're a zombie. Or husband yeah. and kids. Yeah. Right? You're not present. I'm just trying to get into the mental state of these individuals because it's coming. Right. And a lot of people are looking for work and a lot of people are not are getting work, but they're not being paid. So it's like it's it's not even a, a double edged sword anymore. It's like you're getting screwed if you take the work on because you're not getting paid full compensation. Then you're getting screwed because you took the work on. You scheduled it. But now the job has been canceled and now you're just grasping for 
whatever you possibly can, which is right. You might get across an employer who doesn't even give a crap about your mental state, which makes you in a worse situation. And I go back to how many people get out of this industry and in completely because of this, I can't deal with it anymore. There's been a ton of them. I'm one of them. And there's a ton more. I've, I keep like you guys having you guys do it online. I'm only have that one social, which is LinkedIn, but I have a lot of person to person, or at least the very least telephone conversation with people. There's a shit ton of people eyeing uh, uh, their way out of this industry Mm -hmm. because they're just completely fucking fed up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know. And I, I want to challenge leadership in construction to open their fucking eyes because it's, that's going to happen. And if that happens, that's a shit ton of knowledge going. Okay, we know that it's a 50 to 7 ratio, right? For every 50 that are leaving, only 7 are coming in, right? Ooh, it's that so bad. It's around that number, oh right? Okay. It's bad, right? And that's what they're expecting in the next 5 to 10 years because of the workforce. But there's that gap, right? There's yeah, that yeah. gap in between. When late 30s, it was actually it was brought up again when I was at the show. Someone was bringing it up. Late 30s to late 40s, there's a gap in the traits. Mm-hmm. That age group is not there. Mm-hmm. Right, so you have the older age, which is like the late forties, early fifties, and then they're you know older than that, and they're going to get out in the, in the next decade or so. Then you've got the younger ones that are just coming in, wide eyed, beautiful. I love the industry. I want to be a part of this. So then you know they get hurt, 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 hurt. You know, yeah. taking advantage of all this crap, yeah. and that's why they start getting out in the early thirties to mid thirties, right? Mm. So if that's just based on who's leaving and who's coming in. Obviously, we're not replenishing the same amount that's leaving. We don't have the body. Who's right? leaving because of mental state of minds? I like we never talk about those numbers. These are just people that are retired, bodies are broken, they're leaving the industry, and then you've got the younger generation coming in. We haven't even factored in. I'd like to know those numbers about how many people leave this industry because they cannot handle the stressors. Yeah. They have the ADHD. They have all these, you know, these uh, situations going on in their personal lives, professional lives, and then they decide to make that. You know, I'm going to leave. I'm out. I'm gone. I think that's a really interesting point. And if you make a comparison, like back 40, 50, 30, even 30 years ago, people might have gotten into the trades because they didn't have anything else to do. Like we mentioned, immigrants and stuff. They didn't have an option. But now the people who pursue the trades and pursue construction do it so out of passion, I would, I would say, yeah, more often than not. So they want to be in the industry. They like working with their hands. They like building stuff. So I would say most of them are going to leave because of the mental aspect, because they like doing the physical work and they like what construction stands for, but they're not, it's not worth So that number 50 is mental. growing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's another thing. And the Even demand on infrastructure is increasing. Sorry, John Luca. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, the demand was? on infrastructure is increasing because yeah. of population growth and immigration. Yeah. We need more water treatment. We need more roads. We need more houses. We need more hospitals. We need more gyms. We need more libraries. All this shit. It's more and more and more with less people. And hence the reason why this you is... You guys want to work in construction? You want a job? Yeah. No? <laughs> and this is a perfect time for the industry to spartan up and get their act straight. You know, and reclaim the powers that we lost due to that Faustian bargain or deal that with the devil that I mentioned before. And actually say no. And, say, and not only that, educate the public and educate our clients to say, no, it's not, that's not how it's going to go. Because I am responsible for a company wide or my t- I'm responsible for my direct line team if we're just talking about a project. And say, we're not going to do it like that anymore because we found that that only adds more pressure, more stresses, more aggravations, more at the ultimately mental health problems, mental illnesses, and it doesn't help anybody. It actually uh, negatively affects the performance uh, of people and that negatively affects the, uh, the quality of, of, uh, of the outcome. And, and quite frankly, at the end of the day, if you add it all up, it's going to affect the experience that you have with us. So this, it's, is, this is how it's going to roll. This is construction. You can get as many people to say no. You will eventually get to a person who says yes. Yeah. So I'll, uh, so I'll, and I'll the upper add, management agree, knows this. I'll, I'll add on to that. because And we talk a lot too about the differences between the big guys and the small medium enterprises. So at that small medium size, absolutely. There's always a guy who's going to take it for a shit low number. But what I can say, because I don't want to sound too anti-corporate because I know I shit on corporate stuff a lot. But the bigger, I know Elliston, PCL, to, to mention two names, have said no to IOP3 contracts because it was just unreasonable what they're asking for. In this, in, so it happens. They reformat it and they come out with a more amicable thing or they do a JV, minimize the risk, whatever. But there are cases recently, like in the last few years, where a contract has come out and they've said, no fucking way, we're not going to agree to this. So 
You got to put the resistance up or it's not going to change. Well, when you get to that size of job, there's only two, three companies in Canada that can do it. Right. When you get to a tier B or tier C, you got hundreds that you can choose from. Yeah. So it's, it becomes a little well, more difficult. Right, but just because someone says yes to it, doesn't mean that they're going to execute and, get, and, and produce uh, a great experience and a, and, and a great result. Well, it's going to be terrible. I'm okay, sure it so is. Let, so yeah, let, but the listen, terrible I, actions I, I, are falling on who at that point? It's not upper management. It's not the owner of that company. They're subbing it out to the trades. It's the trades that are going to take it hard. Yeah. The, trade, the trades from the, the companies who said yes. So they're saying yes. yes, right? They're saying yes, the, and they're the, taking the, it on. But and, and then there's going to be all kinds of deficiencies. Yeah. It all falls back on the trade that took it on. Don't it? It, uh, it, it doesn't discount the fact that the company who originally said yeah is just as culpable and just as as uh, as guilty of uh, of all of it because even though they've said yes and offloaded it to their sub trades and suppliers, it's the choice of sub trades and, and suppliers that they choose afterwards in order to match their yes. But it's ultimately it's, it starts with the decision of having accepted it. Do you guys? I know I, that so, we've done a lot of these shows here, and I know that we've always painted a, a certain light of the corporate, mm. the, the 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 upper management, right, the mm. above the line kind of those individuals, those corporations. Do they have an argument? Like, are they saying that just like how you said we've said no to recent contracts because these contracts are coming out that are just ridiculous on the amounts and in the expectations yeah. right so do they have an argument is what i'm trying to get at are we seeing their point of view or are they just the bad guy in the tower taking advantage of the little man and woman the, are we talking about the clients now what do you mean like no the, we're talking about the corporations so, the actual so the did, big companies the ones that are making the deals to take on the job i've agreed to take on this job and i mm -hmm. don't care what the workforce is going to do but do they have an argument? Are they just like, I need I, to provide. I need to bring in revenue. Yeah, so I, so I need to take this contract so on. So I'll, I'll address that one if it's okay. Sure. Because I've worked for companies big and small, and I have kind of see it from both sides, even on the owner's side. But when you get to a certain size of corporation, or sorry, when you get to the certain size of a construction company, you become a corporation. And corporations are run by accountants. Yep. It's a number in a spreadsheet. Yep. Cash flow positive. Uh, whatever all, any other terms they use. So it's a business decision at that point. It's not a construction decision. And a lot of times I've been in rooms closing jobs when I was in estimating. Say, well, what are we going to do with this? Operations will figure it out. <laughs> it's like that. So it's, it's a business decision in that moment because they have their target to meet for the quarter. Or they got to meet their margin. They got to do the revenue. And they might not be thinking and they might not have the experience as a PM who's dealt with the shitty job and knows the impact it's going to have on the crew and the people and the delays and all this and that. And as, as we grow here, and, and my generation is interesting because I fall in that category. You said I'm late 30s, about to be 40. And what I'm seeing is experience is being replaced by education because you got a lot of smart people in the industry. I went to school for engineering. I worked with a lot of architects, very intelligent, but don't necessarily have the experience, boots on the ground, how the job comes together, what challenges they're going to face the solutions to those challenges and they think about it as more of a business thing. Am I making any sense? Yeah. You are. Yeah. No. And I was just trying to get some more insight in and try to figure out, are they really the bad guy? I don't think, I, think they're, I think they're making the best decision for their Yeah, that's their what position. I mean. That's what I think Based on the information they have in front of them. Yes. And, and this is where it gets exciting, right? It, so, fine, we've taken the job. Great. We got to hit the numbers. Cool. What's the next, what's the next best thing? You're never going to replace human beings. So mm. what do you do? You do, see how we're around this table? You do that. I, we had to take this job, guys, and here's the pro mm. full transparency, full disclosure. It might be shit. Jonathan, you're going to have a tough time managing it. Okay, bring the guys on site. Take our lessons learned. How are we going to get here? I don't want to make a 10% margin. Yeah. I want to make a, this margin, yeah. right? So what do you need to succeed? That's where the gap is, right? The gap is we've taken the job. It's a shit margin. Operations will figure it out. Operations gets it and says, fuck this. These guys are a bunch of assholes. It mm. goes down to these guys. We're using that same hammer scenario. It goes down to the guys on site. And then they become bitter. And to your point, then they get up and leave. Yeah. Right? So how so yeah. how do you bridge that gap? <laughs> just, how do you bridge that gap and, and mitigate that stress? That's all it is. You oh. get the folks around the table and say, this is what's going on. So I feel like, sorry, sorry if I could just, oh, hit the thing. I think somebody should, the explanation you just gave, somebody should put it in a board book. You know, like a kid, like for toddlers, <laughs> and, and, and it should be in everybody's <laughs> office. This is the, the Make story. Make it out of wood. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, John Luca. Go ahead, buddy. Why not do things differently? 
uncomfortable. Because it works. Because it doesn't feel to some good. people. It works. If if what we just explained works for those people, those are the people that that can just they can keep it. But I go back, and they're to also part point, of the problem. Those people are actually making loads of money because they're <sighs> bending people over the yeah, barrel. They're, they're profiting though on the backs of the you're, and on the, you're, you're hurting the little people. But I don't care. I'm a corporation. It, does that help our reputation? Does that help our our narrative? Do as they industry? really care about that? When you guys are seeing towers go up. Like when I see towers go up in our city, I see hardworking individuals all struggling financially, mentally, all kinds. That's what I see. But when these individuals see those towers go up and they finally go through all the headaches of zoning, all the headaches of approvals and all the headaches of having to get manila envelopes full of fucking cash, like I see them just profiting, profiting, right? And, and at that point too, it's like, you know, again, going back to the, not to pick on estimating, but if you break it down to estimating and operations or pursuits, operations, whatever you want to call it, you look at a job, you're like, okay, there's 100,000 hours. That's going to be a crew of, I don't know, 50 guys for a year. And that's, you know, you're not thinking about the individuals, the tradespeople. That's what I'm getting world. at. That you're, They're you're a number. Saying, exactly. I'm yeah. getting at that. You're, the decisions are being made strictly by accountants mm. because there's a profit margin on there. So we cannot break this spread. So then we don't care if the workforce is going through mental whatever as long as we're hitting these numbers. What's the price on it? Like I said, you can go through as many no's, but eventually you'll get a yes. And then with a younger, more naive workforce coming in, you'll get more yeses. And then they'll get burned, <laughs> no, no. and then they'll okay, get a so no. They'll become a no, and then, then you'll get another what, yes but I, but I think and what, another yes. I think what you were saying is in that Say, I don't know, to use a rough number, say you take on a contract for a million dollars and you know you're going to be driving your crews hard and you're probably going to burn them out. There's a cost in that million dollars for driving them like that and burning them out. Okay, So if you take a step back and spend $100,000, you might think, oh, well, now I'm at 1.1 million. But you might save because they might do the work quicker if they're better equipped and better planned. Is that what you mean? Just try and do things differently? Yeah. Okay. I know, but I'm just trying to be what's currently going on. That's all I'm trying yeah. to say. Oh, that, so that, you're saying you're going to drive people out of the industry is what you're saying. I'm saying that more and more people are going to leave the industry. Yeah. They're going to contribute to the people that are retiring out of the industry because they've been battered and bo- like bruised for their bodies, right? So they can't mm. do it anymore, physically anymore. But now you have to add on the people who mentally can't do it anymore. So the, the answer is in your description. If we stick to what how we've been doing construction f- since Christ was a corporal, we'll... We'll keep getting the same results. We are the, the poster child for Einstein's definition of insanity. Doing the same things over and yeah. over again, expecting yeah. different results. It's fucking simple. But you want different, money. different, you got to do different. But they're making money. I, I look, I, 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 not everybody, I man. The same, not everybody's the making money. The same way that you look at a tower and I see all those same tradespeople, you're seeing, let's say, just like I'll, 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 I'll attach the drywallers. You got a drywall corporation that's going to get that bid. They're going to win it, right? And then you're going to maybe the price is going to get whittled down so low they're going to go, fuck you, we're not going to do it. I don't want to do it. There's another drywall crew ready to go and do it for that mm-hmm. price. Mm-hmm. And even if they don't do it, there's another drywall crew behind mm-hmm. them that's going to do it for even a lower price. Mm-hmm. But in doing differently, suddenly the industry will start dividing. There'll be the, the boneheads who want to do continue doing the way we've, we've been doing things the, the same way. And then there's going to be the people who are going to move a little bit as, aside and create a separate ecosystem you know, to cater to people who want also different. You know, it might be that there, there's always going to be clients that want the deal I, and I'm, always chase just, the dollar sign. I'm there's just, also clients that have learned the hard way and don't want to re- uh, repeat their bad experience. I'm just going, I'm, I'm pretty, I feel confident that the corporation people who are running the corporations are not going through any of the mental fucking stressors that the workforce is going through. How I'd do you know say that? they're going through. Well, that's why I'm asking. Are they're they're different are we being judged? Like, are we judging them to a point where it's like maybe they're going through a lot of yeah, shit? I, think I don't think they things. are. I think their difficulties are trying to figure out how long this golf game is going to go. Or Maserati or Ferrari. Oh, they're, that's they're, their stressors. There are. A lo- uh, there, I can concur that our industry has a lot of leaders that are completely disconnected and spending way too much time golfing and doing sh- other types. But that's of what I'm saying is they're not going through the same mental issues that the workforce is going through. But I, I go. Do back, they care about it? I I come back and say there are leaders that do care, but they're just as buried, but for different yeah. reasons. Yeah. yeah. So here, uh, he oh lost my train of thought. No. Uh, this came up before in, in another show too. 
and I'll play devil's advocate a little bit. And I, we're not ganging up on you because I totally agree with you 100%. We need to do I'm things differently. Anybody. Let her rip, man. We need to do things differently. But I put myself in the shoes of a 50 or 60-year-old white guy who's running a successful corporation. And if you talk to those people and say, I, I bet you this is what their response would be to all this stuff we're talking about. Yeah, we probably could be making more money and all this stuff is good with diversity and talk about mental health. But I know what I'm making now. And if I keep going, I'm going to keep making this much. So why take the risk of fucking that up? <laughs> like, that's I mean, probably and, not and how they was saying say why, if you don't take the risk, it is going to fuck up. But I'm saying you don't take the risk, it is going to fuck up. But there's another crew that's going to come in here and replace that crew. But you know, that, what, you know what the fuck up is going to be? Because we've been doing the same thing over and over again. And you're, you, it's, it's familiar. It's dealing with change, change management. People don't like change. I'm all about this stuff, diversity and all this stuff we're talking about. But it's very uncomfortable and exhausting to have these conversations because not a lot of people are doing it. And you're, you're getting outside of a comfort zone. It, isn't it ironic that an industry that deals with change almost on the daily, they were not able to, to, to handle the own, our own because change? Because they deal with it all the time. They don't want to deal with it. Those are change orders. Yeah, but human, still don't, change. But human beings still don't change. like change, yeah. right? So yeah. it's going to be a rough... I agree with Angela's point where it's like, they don't want to rock the boat. These are my numbers. This is what's coming in. I got to finish that tower. Uh, well, listen, Plus they're uh, looking you, towards the end of their career too. So you're, yeah. you're avoiding the inevitable is, what, is the way I say it. But yes. then also you get, like, you get politicians that are staying an extra year so they can get their pension. Uh, buddy, don't even get me so started. So it's like you're getting corporations it. that you're getting executives that are staying an extra year not rocking the boat so they can get their pension. Mm. But the workforce, we don't have a pension. The power that we that we now have in recent years with the power of social media and getting the word across and getting your story, the narrative of your company, your culture, your your core values across, that is immensely powerful. And I feel that is something that one can not only leverage but benefit from in order to attract your ideal client avatars and your ideal trades. Let's not forget that even trades, not everybody again, I go back to not everybody's work meant to work with each other. It means also sub trades. Of course. Well, I got to deal with the subtrades that I got. Uh, like there's, I'll give you a simple example. If I find myself or I've, if I found myself chasing a trade at the beginning, even before, like during the their tenders, automatically I push them aside. Because if I got to chase them down for a fucking price, I can't imagine what's waiting for me when I give them the fucking job. Mm -hmm. and that comes with experience. I'm not mm -hmm. saying I, I, I am not saying I know everything, but I know enough over the three plus decades that I've been in this, in this industry, that if you, if you firmly root yourself into what you know is true because of experience, because of knowledge that's been passed down, including the wisdom that's, that you've acquired over the decades or years that you've been in the industry and apply it and, and work past the limiting beliefs, the scarcity mindset and adopted a mindset that is uh, anchored into your core values, it's only upside. Only upside. I've got a challenge for you guys to figure out for a future show. I want to see if we can find an executive that will come on the show to discuss all the things that they're doing regarding the workforce. Let's call them out. I'm going to say you guys aren't going to find them. <laughs> yeah. You might find one. But they won't agree to go on mic. How See, much, that's another how thing. How much are you going to give us if we get them here? What's the? So, 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 so <laughs> I will produce that book that you want to create. Well, the challenge is to so bring in an executive <laughs> in that's willing to talk about. Oh, doing willing things, to talk about what that corporation things. is actually doing for the workforce on all levels of workforce, so, diversity, mental, everything. Got it. So doing things differently. Yes. Got it. Basically, so this is exciting because we're preaching about this, this right? Exciting. So, so I'm like, let's find an executive like, that's willing to go there and say, "Listen, I'm the executive of this corporation." These are the projects that we do. Here's the billables that we've done. This is what's going on. And this is what we do for our work. There workforce. are some great guys out there. Yeah, I'm just and saying. And, and I'm willing to say that there are, not only are there, there are these individuals, but I'm willing to say that the small to medium enterprises is where you're going to find it before any, anywhere else. That's why I was earlier saying that I think that there's more... There's more goodness going on at that level than there is at the big corporate level. Definitely, but we're we're also we're lost in the shovel the shuffle. The the uh, the concentration and the accolades are more 
uh, push towards the larger corporations. And that's a bone that I'll that because I have Because those to are pick. media bites and political bites. I realize that. But it, we, again, why do we keep doing that? What's the benefit to the small and medium enterprises who pull most of the weight, by the way? Aggregately in, in dollar wise, you know, it, like I just, we got to get wrapping it up. But it was just it was shitty that I was driving into the core yesterday and the day before to go to the CMPX, and it's a shame that Toronto's become such a corrupted city. It is. I don't give a shit how you slice I, it. And unfortunately, our premier was there at the show doing the ribbon cutting, full security. Mm-hmm. He's a dick. I'm sorry. He's a dick. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. I'm sorry. He <laughs> is a dick. Like, I think anybody who needs full security is a dick. Because you've made too many enemies of um, tradespeople. Mm-hmm. The hardworking individual. You've made too many enemies. So yeah. then you need that protection. But yet, they still have this facade of smiling, shaking hands. How are you doing? I was not interested in shaking his hands. I was not, I was standing there and I was like thinking, should I be the one that's going to yell out the word green belt? Like, what's going on here? Why are we all kissing ass here? I don't understand. This individual is not doing a good job, but he's being praised to do a good job. Come on. That's that's politics. In that's show, politics. Though, so I'm yeah. driving into the city and I'm like, it's a shame. I've known the city for so long and it is such a corrupted city now. Yeah. I'm I'm driving by the Ontario Place there, where it's got all the hoarding up there right now. And you're building a fucking casino there. Like I don't understand that. And you're gonna get a workforce that is gonna do it for a fraction. You're gonna get corporations that are gonna make money, major money off of it. And you're gonna get paid by taxpayers, right? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm driving and I'm seeing this, and I'm like corruption, corruption, corruption. And I keep on thinking about the workforce, and the. They're going to say no, and then you're going to find one's going to say yes. So now imagine all the stressors that our industry has currently and the ones that are waiting for us yeah. once these politicians yeah. pull their head out so of their ass guys, as it relates to the infrastructure and all the housing that we're behind. You find this executive that's going to proudly say that I'm with XYZ Corporation, and this is what we build, and this is what we're doing for the trades person. And this is how we do it differently. This is how we do it differently. Challenge accepted. The gauntlet's been them, thrown. Man. You ain't going to find it. I'm sorry, okay. but you ain't. These are small steps. Hold on, let me make a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's been uh, it's been fun. I know we. Uh, or sorry, John Luca, go ahead, buddy. Everybody's no, I like no, these I shows did. because we started with Karis, and she was really you know open, and, she, and it was great to speak yeah. with her, and she's wonderful. And it'd be great to have her back on the show and talk even more in depth when she's got time, and and maybe even get her and her husband on the show. Get her here. Well, yeah. I, I want to acknowledge Karis, and, yeah. and my biggest takeaway uh, today. Uh, is is what Kara show, uh, shared with us, and that is that we uh, we must continue to focus on the positive. Yeah. So one just last thing I want to say is, as not everyone is as eloquent and able to articulate it as well as Karis. Mm-hmm. There's there's <laughs> for every Karis, there's probably a hundred people out there who are struggling and don't know how to talk to people yep. about it. Yep. So I think it's amazing example of like you know the empathy and compassion that the industry can have because in sharing her experience, uh, you know, should be enlightening for other people. And just on the topic of like, we were bouncing all over the place, but just getting back to the topic of mental health, mental illness. I can't speak for you guys. I know with me, and I might, I'm getting a little emotional now, the further I get into this shit, the darker it gets. And I think that's why not a lot of people like talking about it they because it's really to, fucking uncomfortable and it's really shitty stuff. But guess what? It doesn't go away if you don't talk about it. So I think for the privileged people here, not to say I can't speak for you guys. For myself, I've been through some shit, but in the grand scheme of things, it hasn't been that bad. So for me to be like, oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't like talking about it. It's a disservice to people who are really, truly, deeply struggling. Yep. So thank you guys for having these conversations. And uh, I think they're super, super meaningful. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where are you, Angelina?